We need legal imagination, not only to sow exotic seeds like rights of nature or planning laws with a thousand year horizons, but we need it even more to actually nurture those seeds, to help them grow roots so that these new creations can stabilize themselves and be in there for the long haul for that pathway beyond sustainability. Greetings, ladies, gentlemen, and legal personae. Yes, indeed, legal entities are people too. Or at least they can acquire legal personality. In part because of the legal imagination of lawyers who have come before. A quality that I'm going to convince you today is crucial to our pathway beyond sustainability and the ability to thrive in the 21st century. Legal imagination is institutional imagination and somewhat abstract as a result. But picture a tapestry, a carpet woven of colorful threads. But instead of those threads being red silk or yellow cotton, those threads are made of rules, entitlements, principles, aspects of organizational design. Those are the threads that we weave together to create a stable, creative and responsive structure to support the economy. We can be a bit more concrete Take a prosaic example, like a business company. What is a business company? It's a corporation. And legally speaking, that's a fictional legal person whose liability to pay debts is forever fixed at a capped sum and whose human directors are forever shrouded in a corporate veil. Brought to you by the 16th century. Now, it's no accident that I'm using a corporation as a prime example of legal imagination. Because corporate inventiveness and creativity has brought so much affluence and prosperity, but at the same time, the cumulative extraction wrought by our economic model on social and environmental aspects of our lives is increasingly visible and painfully urgent. And it's for that reason that for me, legal imagination matters. It matters because what we need is to think through for law a task that's really different from that of traditional environmental law. That traditional task is more to create a safety buffer, to prevent damage happening, to slow it down, perhaps sometimes to restore that damage. But we often end up with an image of law as a turgid knot of detailed rules that actually prevents people from doing the good stuff. And in some ways, that quality can protect the planet for a short time. But the task that is required of law to craft a pathway beyond sustainability is very different. It's to build the foundations for a regenerative economy. So a regenerative economy is something, it's a mode of economic development that goes beyond sustainability in the sense that we are not slowing down the damage that we're doing to environment or society. We're doing more than that. We're actually doing even more than restoring damage that has been done. We're redesigning the economic machine, redesigning it from the inside out, so that instead of tweaking it to prevent nasty side effects, we actually build social and environmental values into the heart of the engine and they drive the pathway of development. So I got interested in this whole idea of regenerative economies when I first actually slowed down myself in my research career. And that was in my first year of maternity leave. Um, and at that time, I joined a movement called Transition Towns. And Transition Towns brought ordinary people together at a neighborhood level as ordinary citizens rather than as professionals to figure out ways together to respond to the challenges of climate change. And what we did during that period encompassed everything from rip-roaring street parties to creating the germ of a community-owned wind farm. So it ran the gamut from technical to social and creative all the way through. It was suffused with imagination, humor, energy, and these were qualities I felt that I really wanted to bring back into my research, along with the motivation of responding to our environmental challenges. 
So when I thought about how I could bring those qualities to law, I discovered, to my surprise, that economists had actually stolen a march on the lawyers in the stakes of imagination. Two lines of economic scholarship use vivid metaphors to help us reimagine how the economy might work in very useful, creative ways. One of those is an iceberg, the other a donut. Diverse economy scholars like J.K. Gibson Graham teach us that we should remember that the traditional economy, markets, wages, property, and so on, is really just the tip of an iceberg, and that innumerable practices underneath the waterline, including cooperation, the sharing of resources, unpaid care work, those invisible critical elements are actually what makes the economy work as a whole. And then comes Kate Raworth with the donut, a metaphor for a circular model of economic development that helps us keep that iceberg from melting by encouraging and creating a framework for policies to always sit inside that sweet spot in the middle of the donut, never falling below the social foundation into the hole in the middle, and never going beyond the ecological ceiling that caps what we can do if we are to respect the planetary boundaries that create a safe operating space for both humanity and the planet. So these ideas captured a regenerative economy for me. And the task now was to not let the economists outdo the lawyers, but to think about how law could help bring these ideas alive. So there are a number of different types of laws that can help in this way. And the first I would describe as a sparkly package of accessible evocative ideas like rights of nature. Rights of nature actually give natural formations legal personality, not unlike the way a corporation has legal personality, but designed in a different way to protect nature at its core. So we use human rights to protect human persons and rights of nature take that to the non-human world. And the Blue Mountains Council, west of Sydney, has recently resolved to conduct all its policy operations with the guiding light of rights of nature principles. But we could go even further there's a movement to craft a treaty that would label ecocide a crime against humanity, much as genocide was created as a crime against humanity after the Second World War. And that movement is gathering pace and energy in recent months. And planning laws, more concrete and local, even they could be reimagined in these sparkly, evocative ways if we, for example, as suggested by a farmer recently on a podcast on regenerative agriculture, asked our planning decision makers to think in terms of a thousand year planning horizon when assessing public benefit. Now these ideas are really of a sparkly kind. They're, they're quite accessible, they're evocative. I like to think of them as something relating to the constitution of the biosphere or rewriting a social contract with the planet, if you like. They might seem a little wild and unlikely at times, but they're no more wild than the original idea of legal personality that underpins the corporation. But they lead us back to that corporation, which, as I said, is a crucial aspect of legal imagination. And they lead us into a different terrain of legal imagination and creativity. This is terrain that Indy Johar, he's a British architect, and he calls himself an institutional designer. And he's a passionate advocate of what he calls the boring revolution. So the Boring Revolution has a capital B and a capital R, and contrary to its name, it encourages much play. Now, he doesn't apply it explicitly to law, but in the domain of law, I see the Boring Revolution as encompassing creativity around what we might call transactional law. So transactional law is the technical devices that enable us to exchange things on a market, create a market in the first place, ensure it's competitive, build organizations. It's very much the dark matter of that economic engine. It tends to exist under the hood, and people don't usually lift that hood to investigate its internal workings. But if we think about things like creating a social enterprise or implementing accounting rules or writing governance procedures, even designing the architecture of a digital platform, all of these are aspects of transactional law and to creatively redesign them so that they make that economic engine work to move beyond sustainability, that task that's so important to thriving, that kind of creative redesign takes a very specific and deep kind of focused legal imagination. 
So I'll just give you a few examples from business and money, which are at the heart of transactional law. So new forms of economic enterprise are a really wonderful site for the work of legal imagination. And we can redesign the standard corporation into different forms. We can create benefit corporations, for example, which allow directors to pursue triple bottom line, economic, social, and environmental goals on an equal par without any fear of breaching directors' duties. We could imagine a fair shares association, which protects assets like a charity does, but actually pays out profits at the same time, and not only to investors and shareholders, but also to workers and founders. We could even create something called a DISCO. DISCO is short for Distributed Cooperative Organization. And these are entities who've developed accounting rules that measure not only the work that brings in money, but also that invisible caring work under the iceberg, under the water level, that keeps organizations healthy and flourishing on a day-to-day -day basis. We could also turn to money for some creative ideas. Think of donating to a crowdfunding pitch but instead of becoming a donor, you actually, by virtue of your money contribution, become a co-owner of the project with attendant legal rights to participate in decision making and get income streams. Food Connect Brisbane, a project which connects local consumers with farmers up in Brisbane, raised $2 million for a distribution shed using this method not long after Australia legalised it. So there are endless ways to combine these money and business ideas into a puzzle that works together to create a legal foundation for regenerative innovation. And what I envisage when I think of this is the creation of a whole new type of legal professional, one that's alight with a fever for combining these into inventive combinations like benefit certified self-managed super funds with asset locks. And I hope that you can share some of the excitement and energy that I feel when I think of this institutional creativity. Because this is the nub of it. We need legal imagination, not only to sow exotic seeds like rights of nature or planning laws with a thousand year horizons, but we need it even more to actually nurture those seeds, to help them grow roots so that these new creations can stabilize themselves and be in there for the long haul for that pathway beyond sustainability. And I hope that I'm convincing you that it is actually when law is at its most boring that it matters most. Despite that boring nature, I'll end with a metaphor for law that can perhaps resonate with the creativity of icebergs and donuts. And that metaphor is a spider web. It's not meant to evoke anything of a tangled net of sticky rules. Instead, it's a nod to biomimicry. It's speaking to the idea that we can learn from nature, that we can weave together that responsive, pliable, and yet incredibly strong structure for a pathway beyond sustainability. So we need to stop thinking of law as merely crystallizing the past or stabilizing the present, and let go of images of it choking the future, and instead use our legal imagination to open up the possibility for law to weave creative pathways towards a regenerative future. Many have tried to politicise clean energy generation. And to that I say this, clean energy generation does not have to be political. It is the way of the future, but we need to make sure we get it right. And we need to make sure we get it right now.